what came to me in that little attunement was maybe you don't need to hear a lot about theory um, because I think the concept of interaction first is such a huge and important and distinguishing uh, FOT from, from other approaches that uh, that we want to spend a lot of our time on on that. But I will start by telling you the little story about this video, the uh, the theory of FOT. Um, th there there are two things that that uh, I used to and still do um, advocate for passionately with Jean. One of them was for theory, because in the psychoanalytic world, theory is such an important part of, of feeling grounded and feeling oriented. And it has such a bad name <laughs> in, in the non-psychoanalytic world. And uh, actually, there's newly on our YouTube channel, um, that uh, that Jim is part of the committee for for that, uh, the FOT YouTube channel, a dialogue between uh, Greg and I about theory because we've always argued about the importance of theory. Uh, so you can you can tune into that. But uh, but I wanted I wanted to save uh, all of the wonderful things that I found in psychoanalytic theory from being um, the baby that's thrown out with the bathwater of archaic um, one size fits all uh, non client scented uh, kinds of constructions that fit the client into the into the box. Um, and I said, that's not all of theory. And so I asked Jean to do a, a to do a presentation about theory, and that's what a, a little part of that is. No, you saw the whole thing, and then we're going to show just a little part. You saw the whole thing, and it's very so rich, and I I felt so good that I sort of insisted in that he and that he did it, and then we have it. Um, and it feels so important to me because we, Jean has given us so much about philosophy and so much about practice, but that whole middle range about theory, there's very little about. So I, I see it in levels of, of, of uh, abstraction as a philosophy that is really about how we think. Uh, it's the path of thinking. It's not the thinking itself. It's the mode. Do we think in the what Jean would call the unit model of things and how they relate to each other? Or uh, in Jean's terms, do we do we think um of the processes that we are and the processes of relating that we come out of. Um, and those are very different ways of thinking. Then there's the theoretical level in the middle, which is um, which is what we find there. So the 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 philosophical level is, is um, the path, which path we take of thinking. And the theoretical level is where that leads us, what we find. And different theories, we will see the same thing in different ways and find different things. And uh, the level of practice is the, the concrete level of 
what we do with what we find and how do we do it, right? The, the, the actual doing of psychotherapy and all three are um, different levels of abstraction of the systems of, uh, of psychotherapy. Does that, is that all? But I want to go back for a minute to these three layers, which is just like a little, a little uh, uh, diagram that can help us or not help us. One of the functions of this class is to uh, facilitate all of us being confident enough to take authority because we need all of the voices. We need all of the thinking. Every person has a very particular take on the world that nobody else has. And we need that. And we need to cultivate the confidence as maybe especially in women, maybe especially in women who haven't had, uh, haven't had uh, people cheering for them, you know, and recognizing them. But we need all, we need all of it. We need every voice in this class. So, you know, I, I treasure everybody's way of thinking, not just the people who are the good kids that agree with me, but the, the digested, you know, the process of digesting um, ideas that help us and then forming our own. But I want to use this uh, this little little conversation to um, segue into um, into the 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 next part, which is how this video came to be. The video came to be because I insisted, and we all gather around my living room. But then I think it was a couple of years later. Uh, the Focusing Institute asked me to, no, Jean called me up. This this was, Jean called me up and asked me to, to help with fundraising. So they were needing money. And I thought, my God, that's not me. You know, that I don't do that. I know nothing about, <laughs> about finance. Um, and uh, I said, no, and I hung up. And then, um, this idea came to me full blown of using this video of uh, uh, the theory of focusing oriented therapy to bring everybody together in the world and have each community have a showing of the video in translation and have discussions and people would contribute money when they would come to these things. And it was wonderful. And you can find all of that on YouTube if you have the time to watch it. Um, but we we have scenes from many different communities around. I think we have a, uh, Stephen from Brazil, right? Um, and, uh, and what people made of these theoretical points. Um, and one of the people in New York that that gave a talk was Janet Funder. And I just loved her talk and many people have loved it. And uh, it was very tragic that she, she died before she could really put her thinking out in the world very much. She was a wonderful teacher. And uh, we're gonna watch a little clip of, of hers as a way of looking at how people have digested this material. Um, let's go right into this first point about interaction first. Authority of um, saying your own unique way of thinking and putting things together can be evocative and that's what you're talking about when you have a feeling of something but you've never been able to put it into words 
And then somebody says, some theoretician um, says it in, in their way. And you say, oh, that's like what I was, it's not exactly, it's like what I was trying to say. I remember in the, in my youth, everybody was reading the book, um, Drama of the Gifted Child. And did, did any of you read that book? Ra raise your hands if you read that book. Wow, she really made an impact, didn't she? Ima imagine if she was afraid to take the authority to write that book. And she said, oh, you know, who am I to say? But that has influenced generations of people who sort of, and, and um, uh, given people a lens of seeing very, very early accommodation in a different way that they wouldn't notice. Theory is also sort of like a consciousness raising. Um, so I love what you said. I, I also wanted to say that that if that in the early seventies, uh, the people that I hung out with would say, as a motto, question authority. And I love that too. Take authority and question authority that the the authority to uh, and the confidence, the incredible confidence to say uh, you have within you this carrying forward energy, this life force and trust that. And I will help you trust that as Jean helped me to, to argue with him, you know, trust the process in you and the, the, the philosophy that, that makes room for the process in the individual to be a uh, paramount, to, to, to come first. The, the, so just to, to, uh, to summarize very briefly the uh, levels of interaction first, which is my next point, the philosophical level, as you're saying, Natty, and you also, Mariana, is, is a way of thinking about uh, life as process rather than as things. And we can say that, but it's very, very hard to think that way. And it takes years to, to, to sort of find your way into thinking that way, although some people may have it naturally. Um, most of us in the West have more thingifying, you know, making everything things. Um, this thing, this the the client is a thing that's a borderline or a obsessive compulsive, and the therapist is a thing that has um, early trauma, and the way they interact is like that. But there are these things, and to think about this process and this process and how that makes. Um, a system that that's really a very different way of of thinking in in my schema there of philosophy theory and practice that's a theoretical question right how do you know where does authority as a therapist come in uh, and it references this philosophy of what is the interaction going to you know, how is that going to make an interaction that will make things grow better? Um, and then the, and then the, um, the clinical <clears throat> uh, practice issue of how can I take my authority with the client and at the same time have 
give the client the space to have their own authority, encourage them to have their own authority? And that's a very big question, maybe one of the biggest clinical questions, right? To be able to take the authority to say how I see things but then right away, and Jean says it should be in the same sentence to say, uh, but how is that for you? So I may take authority to say something um, that I don't know about at all. Like, uh, I don't think I, I said to a suicidal client, uh, I really don't think that um, that killing yourself is going to, to help things for anybody, for the world, or for you. I think that life has something to get from you and to give to you or something like that. Now, I'm taking authority to say something very, I mean, who am I to say that? But if I say that with my full conviction, it has a very different impact and makes a different interaction. And then I can say, but, but how is it for me to say that? Who am I to say that to you? And so I, I can have both the conviction and also the humility and the, um, uh, what is it that Donna Orange calls it? Uh, fallibilism she calls it a, a theory of fallibilism you know that we're fallible for those of you who don't speak english as a first language like it's you you, you we're all prone to making mistakes so you can't take what i say as the the last word so this idea of how do we look at this big concept of thinking in terms of processes and see the world like we all have this uh, authority, as, as Natty pointed out, to find our own truth, and that's important to the world, that truth, um, and the practice of how do we implement that in therapy and we're going to be talking about that after we see um after we see the little clip and and also i'll be sharing something some points with you after we see the clip about how we how we do that in practice how do we what 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 difference does it make philosophy and theory have to make a difference in uh in our sessions you know uh jean says in the in the video that we know all of this but that theory explains it and i think theory does explain things but i think even more deeply theory orients us the orient is a term for the and system. um as it orients us it it evokes different ways of conceptualizing different ways of of being um i'm thinking of, of greg now because greg says there has that there has to be an in-between step of just being in the not knowing before we have the step of finding a theoretical grounding so that sounds good to me. That's in the pause. Okay, let's see the uh, the video, the little video clip about interaction first. Does anybody have a, a comment before we do that? The first point I want to make is has a name, and the name of it is interaction is first. Interaction first. So what, is it, what does that mean? I'll come back to it. The question, the theoretical question is, why does therapy work when it works? And 
that's the question. Now look what I do. First I get very specific about how I would like that question to go before I try to answer it. So how I would like it to go is why would it help anybody to say, to talk about, to express their trouble? And this is, of course, what the person who doesn't know anything about therapy would ask you. You know, yeah, well, whenever I get into those things, I just feel bad. So I go and I pay you to tell you all these things, and it's just going to make me feel bad, isn't it? And the usual answer to that would be, you're a doctor, you're a wise guy, you're going to tell me some solutions that I can't think of. And we all know that isn't quite true, right? So the question is, if if the therapist or the listener, whoever that might be, is not going to give answers to the person's problems, because we don't really know any answers, what is going on such that it sometimes helps to do this, right? It's probably the first question you ever thought of. It can't be a question that you haven't thought about. <laughs> You know, this person's going to come, they're going to tell me all their troubles, they're going to cry, they're going to complain, they're going to be stuck, and then they're going to say, well, doctor, what do I do? And then I'm not going to know what to do, and there isn't anybody who's ever practiced who, who hasn't thought about that. And the question, theoretically, is, well, what is supposed to work here? What is supposed to happen such that this paradox works? such that going into and feeling all over again all these bad things will make you better. What is that? What happens there? Theoretically, my answer, don't forget all theories are sometimes wrong, my answer is that a human being is not a box full of content, whether you call them experiences, or feelings, or, or dynamic circuits, or whatever, however you want to think about the, what I call the content. A human being is not the content. A human being is interaction. And notice that I'm violating the grammar by saying that. I'm supposed to say a human being is in interaction, because the word interaction is so structured grammatically that there's supposed to be an A and then a B and then they interact. And instead of that, I'm saying something strange. I'm saying, no, I think we are interactions. I think living bodies are interactions with the air and the ground and the food and other species members. I think we are interactions. And from that point of view, if you look at a person, like if you're looking at me, you can see that I'm interaction, right? I've got these eyes and these hands and these feet on the ground and these sexual organs and this inhaling, exhaling and this sweating out and taking in. You see it? I am interaction. And not just on the physical level. I'm interaction with other people. Nine months with my mother before I was even born and then everybody else, the people in my so-called head, which is really further down than my, just my head, all those people from the past and my present life and you people here, and then I am also a special kind of interaction with myself. So while I'm talking, that's going on more, more below. But when I stop, or right away I talk to myself. I say, hmm, do you think you said it? Do you think that made sense to them? Do they look like they, you know? Uh, so that too is interaction. Okay. So I'd love to hear, you know, your response to that, your feeling about that and anything that you might have about how that changes the way we do therapy. So when we think of therapy, not as something I'm giving to somebody else, and if they're a good client, they take what I'm giving, 
and are grateful for it. And if they're a problematic client, they reject what I'm giving. Instead of thinking of it that way, um, if we think of, of therapy as a, an interaction, a dance, uh, it, it really has a very different flavor. And the dance very often is uh, asymmetrical where the, the therapist is the big one in the, in the dance and the, the, the client gets to be, is allowed to be their little one, the, the raw one, the um, unprocessed one. Um, it's not always that configuration. The dance sometimes the dances are very symmetrical. Um, but I, I I have the memory of um, when I was a a young woman, uh, having gone to a strict uh, fundamentalist school. I didn't know how to dance, and I felt like oh, to have a boyfriend, I have to learn how to dance. And I went to Arthur Murray's, which was this dance, this dance class, and uh, knew nothing about dancing because it had been forbidden. And so this man, who was assigned to me as the the dance teacher, uh, just put his arms ar around me and told me how to put my hands on him and just guided me. It was just a wonderful experience. I felt so held and safe. And I had been so intimidated by, you know, I'll step on everybody's feet, which I did. But with with this guy, he he either knew how to keep his feet out from under mine or didn't mind my stepping on his feet. And uh, and I've I've often thought of a therapist as as uh, being a good dance partner, uh, especially for people who've been hurt or people who haven't learned to dance, but also for anybody, right? To to be that good dance partner, it makes such a difference. Um, this concept uh, in what you what you're thinking about in therapy, because you're always thinking about things. Are you thinking about what's the problem and how can I help to solve it? I think we all think that even though we don't want to think that. Um, I have a client that's always sort of yelling at me, you're trying to fix it again. You're not trying to make me feel better. Um, <laughs> and then I have to look and see that whether that's true or not. Um, but uh, when we're thinking in terms of interaction, first we think, well, how are we being together? What's the atmosphere here? What are we trying to say or do? What's this moment hold? What are we afraid of saying or doing or being? What are we enjoying? What, you know, so it's it's these we kinds of questions in our mind. If you're a dance partner, some of the interactions of the dance might be painful. Uh, you might get dropped or drop the other person. You might get get hurt. But that's but that's the two of you together. So it's that us thinking. We're having a, a difficult interaction, and then being able to name it can be very helpful. To say, oh, we're we're dancing around this, or we're we're. Um, uh, I always love what Jean said. We're like this right now, you know, and to name the difficulty of this is this we're trying to find our way, but we're, we're really lost, or we're re really kind of mad at each other right now, or it seems.
Do you feel that? Uh, it's very hard to leave an interaction. And what's happening inside is, is more important. Sometimes you as uh, uh, you can leave an interaction inside, and then you can be in the interaction with the person. Uh, and that's that's particularly helpful in therapy where you don't want to leave the client, but you want to leave the interaction. Uh, I always say you can't change the person, but you can change the dynamic. You can change the mm -hmm. dance. And, and that's mm -hmm. um, something that you might not be able to do with the person. I also want to say that uh, the idea of giving someone space, we, we don't give enough uh, credence to that, that it's a gift. To give someone space is something we're giving. We're not just uh -huh. abandoning the person. I mean, we might be abandoning the person, but that's not always the case. The case may be, this is, this is too hot to handle. It can be um, shown that way uh, rather than in an angry and an angry, you know, I'm not going to talk to you way, which of course is part of interactions too, to say that. Yeah, that's a big, big question, right? Of where, where, we, where we say stop, mm -hmm. or what stop is, or what spirit it's, it's in, um, and how we do it and all of that. I, I was picturing Stephen in, in therapy, the client saying, well, I, I can, I'm a client. I can jump up and down on your foot and call it anything I want to call it. Uh -huh. And, and of course you can't stop. You can't tell the client what they can call something, but you could say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to leave my foot there. <laughs> I'm taking I'm I'm picking up my foot so that <laughs> it's 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 wonderful when we can take the authority to make the interaction. I mean that's what Jean says our main job is to make the interaction better. And and we have the authority to do that. So, of course we, we can't always use it because we're um we're triggered and then we're in our little uh, child place feeling helpless and feeling uh, enraged and feeling whatever. Um, but, but then it's about, you know, finding our way back to the, the place where we find ourselves again. And that's such an important part of it, right, is that um, is that we're seeing beyond the the eye. I am hurt. My foot is stepped on. Seeing beyond that to the interaction of this person. Uh, this person feels has learned experiences that that's the only way you know, to relate in this kind of circumstance to this kind of person. And, and what, and what am I bringing? Maybe I'm bringing uh, a sensitive, very sensitive feet to the, to the interaction. Um, and that, th that question of what am I contributing here? How are we together? making this um, and many times people will say well there's objective counter transference anybody would have trouble with this client right this client does this to everybody in their lives so therefore it's the client doing it to me have, have you heard that or is that more in the psychoanalytic world i've i've certainly uh, certainly heard that a lot. Uh, yeah, sure. 
and 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 what would we say to that you know this client does this to everybody of course it's objective nobody could do any better with this person the the dance is is what the psychoanalytic world would call the third there's this and this and that's the you know, the polarization can come there of this thing and this thing. But the third is the, the more of all of that. Um, it's something that transcends the thingifying of this and this. And the, the music is a wonderful, I never thought of that. That's great. And the, the music is something you're making together. You're jamming. It's not just that the music appears from from Gene's point of view. I I don't like that he said the word better because I don't think things are linear like better and worse. But um, but but he meant more alive, more fully ourselves. That kind of better the interaction we can really feel when the interaction comes to life. We can really feel when. Uh, the energy is is different, and it might be when we're talking about something that's very depressing or something that's enraging or whatever. I want to be able to uh, play you uh, the clip from Janet, and I have to tell you a couple of other things before I do that. But let me think back. What I what do I have to tell you? I have to tell you that on the simplest level uh, that I like, I like simple levels, uh, concrete levels, interaction first means that your way of interacting together is the most important thing. In a group, in, in, uh, in anything, the way of interacting not the content is the most important thing. Um, Jean, uh, it's interesting because we're usually talking about an issue, right? And then it's kind of ironic that we're talking about an issue, but the really important thing is the way we're talking about it, the interaction, not the not the the issue will will be the fruit of that interaction. Jean had a phrase that I I think I've described before, but it's a beautiful one. He he said it's not what we're saying in therapy, it's the doing in the saying. It's what we're doing. So I might be. I'll give you an example, and I have to make it quick because I want to get to Janet. But uh, the the example is of um, a client who um, was feeling enraged and and despairing because one of her students um, quit her class because she had had a, a moment of silence at the end just to hold the conflict with Israel and. Uh, and Gaza, and the student was very offended by this and said, you know, I don't come to this class to learn about that. I I come to, you know, to learn about the content of the class and uh, and it really brought me down um, and I'm and I'm quitting. And uh, she, my my client was so in, outraged and saying, you know, these people who are so entitled and they want me to do just what they want me to do. And um, uh, and I gave a lot of time to, to this person and um, many, many, uh, many, many upsets. And I was thinking to myself, because she uh, is also a, knows my work and, and, uh, learns learns it oh if she knew listening and could listen 
to the guy and say, what was it that brought you down all day about this? Uh, that would change the interaction. But I didn't say it. I, I said that that's not going to be a good way to go to tell her what to do. Uh, but in order to help myself not to do that, I did the opposite. And I said, what would you want to say to this guy if he were right here? You know, and you could say anything you wanted. And she said, oh, you uh, spoiled brat, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and sort of got it out of her system. And, and then I asked her how she felt. And she said, well, it didn't really change it. It still felt all clogged up inside her. And she said, I felt so dismissed. And when she said that, it was like I really got something different. And then I was able in myself, uh, not just what I was what I was saying, but really in myself to be in a listening mode. And um I and uh what happened then? There was another she said this was a very important part. She said, I know you're going to say I should be on its side. And uh, I can't be on its side. I think this guy is off the wall and I think it was very unfair that he just quit. Um, and I said, oh, and this was that moment where <clears throat> I was doing the, the thing that Jean does about, uh, oh, oh, that's, you know, that, oh, that's the dance. She feels I'm criticizing her and I was in my mind. So it didn't matter what I was saying. I was in my mind thinking, oh, she should learn listening. Uh, and I said, you you don't feel even really um, like you can be uh, yourself with me. Uh, I'm going to criticize you, and um, and she said, "Yes, it's it it's I give so much." And I said, "Oh, I know your whole soul is in this class." And she said, "It's like when I was a kid with my mother, who, you know, I would I would do so much for the family, and they didn't see it at all. They didn't acknowledge it because my values were so different than theirs." And I never did say, <laughs> I never did say the part about uh, the the listening. And I didn't say that I had been thinking that because it just wasn't the the right timing for that. Although, you know, I certainly would say that if if that comes up. But that was such an example for me about it's what we're doing. It's not the saying. Because I was saying you know, what would you say to him? And, but what I was doing inside myself was saying, uh, you really need blah, 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 and you should do this. So I was uh, I was also in my mind uh, telling her how to be. Many years of immersion in focusing practice and experience and teaching focusing and studying focusing and studying the philosophy and theory all together has really brought a major shift in my experience of being a therapist. Mm -hmm. And thinking about this, what I would say today, I thought I, in my family as the first child, I was a listener, pretty much a professional listener. I learned that this solved a lot of problems to be a professional listener. And then I became a very professional listener by becoming a therapist. And then I, um, 
somehow was still trapped in that legacy and there was not a feeling of being free as a person. Then I became more immersed in studying psychoanalysis and interpersonal, the interpersonal dimensions and the interactive dimensions. But the particular involvement that I found myself in, I guess existential psychoanalysis, was with uh, someone poetic, responsive, wonderful, however it veered to the opposite extreme of too penetrating. Uh, at times pathologizing and interaction. So I love the liveliness of interaction, more interacting, but it wasn't right either. It was kind of an opposite. Focusing oriented therapy has given me a way to be a living, breathing person as I'm listening, and a way to be actively responsive in all different ways, of course, different moments, different clients whether I'm being silent or actively speaking, to, to feel I'm a person there with another person. And now to think we are one interaction is even better. We are living an interaction. So I want to speak to one of the things, um, I don't know, I, it's in this transcript, I think it was probably in the video too, where he said, the interaction is so much more than the two individual pe participants' perceptions of it. And this is an important philosophical point. He has a philosophy paper called uh, The Primacy of the Body, Not the Primacy of Perception, which is an answer to Merleau-Ponty's The Primacy of Perception, which is beautiful. However, Gene carries philosophy forward. Um, by speaking about the knowing that we have that's beyond what we know through hearing and seeing and smelling and tasting the five senses. We know in a bodily way, in a whole bodily way. And he coined the phrase the plant body, which I don't, haven't heard any other philosopher use. Um, we, have pl we, we can all think of having animal bodies we're humans, we have some, they're all the richness of animal bodies. We also have plant bodies. Plants live and know how to use sunlight and water be, without having eyes and ears, without having perceptions, what he calls the five peepholes of perception. <laughs> they're not gathering information in through perception. They know with their whole bodies how to use sunlight and water. So this is one example of a way in which Jean's philosophy has nurtured me in a very deep conceptual way in the intimacy of interaction in a therapy session. I really have come to trust so deeply in this knowing beyond what I can think and trusting the sensing this, the, that was so beautifully expressed in these cases to sense in this deep way and in one moment there in the, in the DVD when Gene was talking about even when he's doing focusing alone, what gets him out of a self-deprecatory attitude is pausing and waiting for something fresh to come. And learning, practicing that slowing down, that pausing, waiting for something fresh to come. It's just so beautiful, it's so relaxing <laughs> to trust that deeply. And then this pausing gets built into therapy, the pausing for what's not yet known. And I have a client now who always wants, who always inquires into, well, what are you thinking about what I just said? What do you feel about what I just said? Do you have anything like that going on with you? Do you have you ever had that? So I've had years of preparation now to be able <laughs> Years of building up to this kind of person who wants this intense back and forth in the moment. And I can say, well, something just came. This is what came as I listened to you. And just see if this resonates. That's a question I can ask. I'll say it, but I would like you to just see if it's useful to you or if it resonates. And she'll say, yes, oh God, what a relief. Or, well, well. You know, there's a pausing, there's a way in which 
any phenomenon opens out into what he calls the implicit intricacy, because we need complex terms to make people ask, what is that? Um, uh, I also like this word, neck. Immer being immersed in focusing experience, one develops the knack of letting things come by surprise freshly, sometimes saying them out loud, sometimes saying better not, but trusting that something is being evoked, perhaps, that's useful to the other person. And this is, for me, being a person without self-disclosure. It's not about self-disclosure. It's about being a person. I can be... Um, I'm a person with a person instead of a listen, I don't know, a listening pattern. <laughs> okay, that's it. One more minute. Let me just see in my little crib sheet if there's any, oh yes. This idea that life carries forward and when there's something stuck, there's still simultaneously a wanting to carry forward. There's an implying, a wanting, but the right next step just hasn't occurred, or come, or arisen, or formed. This really is, for me as a therapist, a carrying forward beyond all the categories, diagnostic categories, although ways of thinking about things can be useful. With all the various conflicting ways of thinking about things are very enlivening. But over time, that deepening trust that there is a wanting to carry forward yeah. life. It's a different view. Of, it's a special view of life that I have come to adopt. <laughs> As I adopt that point of view about the universe, about life, something in me relaxes. And I'll just say that, a, okay, that's it. <laughs> all right, one last thing. And I want to say that all the little, because of this DVD and the talk, I was carried forward. I was aware that all my interactions with each one of you in micro moments today, saying hello in various ways to people and our interactions, carried me forward into feeling more, a little more relaxed and definitely more connected. And it's so good. Thank you for carrying me forward. <laughs> Seeing Janet makes me smile. I think that uh, um, I hope that Janet wouldn't mind my saying this. I don't think she would. That years earlier, before she was introduced to focusing, that the the client who was demanding a lot of immediate back and forth would have been intimidating for her and the dance would have been very different. Uh, you know, she might have said, well, you know, this is about you and I want you to uh, tell me what you, what you think about it. Uh, I don't know that she would have done that, but that, that, uh, when we think of it as a dance, it it helps us to really also see how we need to stretch and grow uh, to be able to dance with different people. I was struck by by Janet saying that her um, that her analysis, her psychoanalysis, she felt too penetrated and pathologized. And then focusing was this sort of antidote to that. Of course, we all have to be ourselves and we all have different energies, different personalities, different ways of being. Um, but we can also sort of develop uh, the, the ways of other people. So I have an inner Janet. I could say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like Janet right now if I feel sort of, uh, you know, scattered or something like that, and then I could just, you know, take that, take that on. Um, my last point here is just something a little bit more concrete. 
um, Jean and I talked about, uh, as you know from other classes, the relational stuff and how it manifests in therapy a lot. And uh, my wanting to carry forward his ideas about interaction first in terms of really spelling out how the interaction brings out the people rather than only the people making the interaction. And um, so he wrote me a, an email that uh, I asked Jim to put on the resource page. I'll, I'll also send it to you, uh, where we were talking about these three different um, three different levels of interaction first. And so it has what he said, and then it has in bold what what I said um, to to contribute. When I was reading it again this morning, I thought that's funny that I put mine in bold. You know, <laughs> I wanted him to listen to me, uh, but uh, but it was also to to share with other people. So I I'm going to ask Katerina if you have that on hand, just to to read what he said and then what I said about actual. Uh, things that one could say or do in a therapy session that prioritizes the the relational. When everything is smooth, this kind of relating is a special move. Really, three moves. One, therapists ask themselves, what is implicitly going on? in the relationship, what is implicitly going on in the relationship. Two, then we can ask inside for phrases to speak from that. One possibility after another can come until one feels okay to say or ask. It need not turn out to be right because we, we will be corrected by a fresh relational expression from the client. Just the sort of thing we like to have happen. Notice that he asks himself, which is a very good starting place, well, what's going on here? Is the client trying to convince me that um that it's better if he kills himself am i trying to convince the client to uh do this or that in her life or uh is there a, a power struggle or something going on uh are we um are we avoiding something? Are we, uh, whatever it is. So we, we uh, he feels inside what it is and then finds a way of bringing it up, like to say, you know, we're like this right now, some way, a brief way. And, and he was very good at that, not taking up a lot of space, giving a whole thing that would drown the, the client in his thoughts but finding a way of saying it and then wanting the client to say well no it's more like blah 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 or oh yeah i'm glad that you're bringing that up uh in my example with with my uh with my client who was upset with the student I'm, I'm, if, if there had been a space for that, that would be, um, where, where, uh, that would fit, I might have said, you know, how is it feeling to, uh, tell me about it? And then that would have, uh, given her permission, um, to say, you know, I think you're going to convince me to, to do it a different way, to feel a different way. 
Um, so we'll we'll let's read my little uh, things that one could say, and then we'll have a couple of minutes to talk about it. Your edition. How is it to talk about that here? These are in the chat as well. If you don't need to write them down, does that happen with me? What needs to happen with us here to make that different? What is the feeling of our being together right now? I don't exactly like the way I said some of those things because I wrote it years ago. Um, but, but you sort of get the point of finding a way of asking into the immediacy of the interaction in the session. Do you have anything to add to that? Or subtract from it or do anything else? Maybe how much time do you need? Uh, a few minutes, hours, days, a week? So the, the client or the student has, has a choice whether to respond right away or, or reflect and come back. Hmm. Well, how much time do you need is a you question. How could we make that an us question? This is all about yeah. making an us, right? We don't have to make the us. The us is there, but we're making it in the conversation. Yeah. What you, kind of time will we give? Will we give a few minutes or? Yeah, maybe like, is this something to flag up now and we come back to, or does this need our attention right now? Or something like that. I'm imagining when you say that, Katerina, that maybe the client feels pressured about time and and needs more time than I have to give. So in that case, I might say, um, I have a feeling that more time is needed. Um, and this is this is just a little snitch right uh how how is that for you so i would be uh saying something that comes to me about about our immediate interaction but then handing it over to the to the client the client might say yeah you're always so busy and then i don't even get to finish my story and then the bell rings and you know and then we, we have what's happening between us. And I and I wonder if the, the client asks me, let's just play with Katerina's example. The client says, you know, you you're always so busy, and then the bell rings and I don't have time. And then I I will usually start with a reflection and then that gives me time to chance to time to take in what the the client is feeling but then what comes to me so i i would say uh you feel so rushed and it it seems like my life is rushed and there isn't adequate time for you. So that's the reflection place. Um, and, and let's say the client says, yeah, 
I I asked you to give me two times a week therapy and and you said you don't have time. So then I I'm going to sense into myself and say, well, yeah, you know, there is a rushed quality to my time, my my time and I don't like that either. We're we're up against that. And both of us are wanting a more spacious time together to let things unfold, I might say. Or I might say, uh, I don't I don't feel particularly rushed, but I certainly see how you would feel rushed here with 50 minutes and my starting the next session you know in 10 minutes after that or whatever it is but i think that 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 there's all these taboos about and there are taboos and there are also uh minefields you know if you if you say something that could be hurtful if you're if you're only feeling into your own experience you might say something that's hurtful but if you're sensing into the us it's not uh it's not only how i feel or how the person feels but what we're experiencing together that that i think I think there's less uh it's it's less uh less problematic. Although many times what we're feeling is is really needed. That's the uh where the rubber meets the road as a focusing oriented therapist, right? We believe, we trust. Our faith is that something always comes, but what if it doesn't? Well, then that's a something, right? Nothing comes to me right now. I'm going to give this a lot of thought and see, right? 